Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for thy blessings. Thank you for this opportunity and the health and strength that you've given us to be in your house one more time. We pray your blessings upon every home represented. And we pray in Jesus' name that thy Holy Spirit will have right of way. Thank you for the beautiful music, the singing, the message in song. Thank you for the fellowship of these people. And we pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you might ever make this church a lighthouse in this community where the gospel can be heard, where people can be encouraged. God, we ask in Jesus' name that you'll overshadow us in these next few moments. May your Holy Spirit anoint us with fresh oil from heaven's throne. And may the words that come forth be, Lord, of your own choosing, that they might find lodging in our hearts. We give you thanks for the service this morning and for all that you've done for us. Your word teaches us in everything to give thanks. And God, we couldn't begin to enumerate all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We just say thank you for everything tonight. In Jesus' name we ask all of this. Amen. <clears throat> My wife asked me yesterday what I was going to preach on this morning. And I said, honey, I'm going to preach on, we were busy here and there. And I said, and I'll be the first one to the altar. A lady going out the door said, Brother Daniels, I know that I was guilty of the sermon you preached this morning. And I said, ma'am, didn't you see me go to the altar? She said, yes, and I should have been there too. You know, I thank God that he remembers that we're flesh. He knows our frame. And God will always remember, as long as we're in this human body, that we're flesh. Someday we'll have a body like His. Someday we'll be perfect in every way. But until then, God will always remember that we're flesh. I thank God for that tonight. The story was told of a preacher pastored a certain church and one of the members bought him a suit and the suit had two pairs of trousers with it and it was weather like this and they didn't have air conditioning back then and the following Sunday morning the preacher was preaching in the suit and he thanked the brother publicly for buying him a new suit with two pairs of trousers but he said, Brother, I want to be honest with you. If it gets much hotter in here, I'm going to have to take off one pair of these trousers. <laughs> in everything, give thanks. You ever stop to think about how good God is and the blessings that we have? I heard a story one time of a lady who had been healed she had been at death's door and she hadn't been able to be outside for six months. Not even to just go out in the yard. Bed fast for most of that time. And miraculously, God healed her. And she was uptown the next day going down Main Street, wiping the tears and telling everyone, I've been healed. I thank God for the sunshine. I thank Him that I can walk. And a fellow saw her and came up to her and said, Ma'am, what in the world are you so happy about? And when she told him, he said, Well, ma'am, I suppose if all of that had happened to me, I would be thankful too. And there he walked on down the street in good health, had not been bedfast for six months, was not sick then, had all of the time to enjoy life, and said, if that had happened to me, I would be thankful too. Why couldn't he have just realized, God, I thank you that I haven't been sick. I thank you that you have blessed me. I thank you for my health. I thank you for my strength. And in the church service one time during World War II, a couple donated $1,000 in memory of their son who had been killed on the battlefield. A thousand dollars. And the pastor commended them, thanked them for it. And then another couple walked down the aisle and said, we'd like to give a thousand dollars 
because our son wasn't killed on the battlefield. So easy sometimes. So easy sometimes to not really see what we have. We're like the little girl whose grandpa took her uptown one day and every store window they went by, she said, Papa, get me that. Papa, get me that. Papa, get me that. And finally he said, Honey, can't you think of anything but get, get, get? Can't you think of give? She said, Yes, what you going to give me? <laughs> she hadn't forgot where she is coming from. I want to read to us tonight Matthew chapter 25 and starting at verse 41. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. <clears throat> this is very familiar reading but I pray that God might help us to see a truth in this tonight and in a way maybe that we hadn't seen before Matthew chapter 25 starting at verse 41 then shall he say unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in, naked and you clothed me not, sick and in prison, and you visited me not. And then I want to read one more verse of scripture found in James chapter four and verse 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You know, I've been persuaded down through the years that we don't acquaint sin unless it's doing wrong or committing wrong. I guess I mean the sins of commission, actually carrying out the deed. I've always been taught that sin is a transgression of God's law. It's actually committing a willful transgression against God. But I don't think in most of our learning that we realize or acquainted sin with not doing something. You know what I mean? I recall the scriptures abstain from all appearance of evil. I recall the Ten Commandments that says, Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And to me that was not sinning. That's what it was all about. It was all in the negative. And when I was a little boy, I held back on getting saved and becoming a Christian because I didn't want to just all the time be trying to keep from doing anything wrong. That's what I thought being a Christian was. I thought I, I'll have to watch what I say all the time. I won't be able to go here no more. And folks, when I was a kid, they preached strong against going to the movies. I mean, the state theater in the Strand where I went to see Gene Autry. <laughs> and I never heard no curse words. They didn't drink liquor. Uh, compared to the movie stars of today, they were saints. Honestly, they were. And, and then a serial would come along, you know. And I remember Spy Smasher. Oh, man. <laughs> when he first came out, he wore these goggles and this, had this cape. And every kid on our block would tie a towel around their neck, you know, and go running down the street, look back, see if that cape was a flying. But at the end of every episode, he was just about to get killed. You know what I mean? Just about to go over a cliff or a big uh, uh, sawmill saw was about to saw him in too, you know. And then we'd go to church on Sunday and I'd get under conviction. But I'd say, I can't go to the altar. I've got to go back next Saturday and see how he gets out of that. <laughs> and you see, I didn't think I could keep from doing so many things that I enjoyed doing. And to me, living a Christian life and not sinning was trying to keep from doing anything wrong. I never really acquainted it with the scripture that I just quoted. He that knoweth. To do good and doeth it not to him it is sin think about that he that knoweth to do good you see I, I equated sin with cheating and lying and stealing jealousy taking God's name in to me that was sinning 
but not doing anything. Hmm? That didn't register with me until I began to study the Bible pretty closely. Now, if this scripture would say, to him that knoweth to do bad and doeth it, to him it is sin. I could have, I could have grasped that right off. <laughs> but to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, that's sin. According to James, that's what he's saying to us. To him that knoweth to do good. Let me give you an illustration. Suppose the war is on and there's a battle being fought. And people are fighting for their lives and their country. And over here, there's a fellow named Evans eating a hamburger and drinking a Coke. And the captain says, where's Evans? They said, there he is. And, the, and they're shooting and they're high. The war's raging. And the captain goes over to Evans and says, Evans, you're doing wrong. He says, I am not. I'm just eating a hamburger. Anything wrong with a Coke? This isn't liquor. Hmm? I haven't committed immorality. I'm not stealing anything. Anything wrong with eating a hamburger and drinking a Coke? You see, he knows to do good. He knows to get in the battle. But he's not doing it, and therefore, he's doing wrong. Suppose a building is on fire, and the firemen are fighting the fire. And the fire chief is going around making sure everything's going fine, and here's one of the firemen leaning up against the truck, clipping his fingernails. He says, man, you're doing wrong. No, I'm not. I haven't, I haven't taken God's name in vain since I got here. I haven't stolen anything. I'm not committing immorality. I haven't uh, uh, taken drugs or anything. Anything wrong with clipping your fingernails? Yeah, but there's a fire and you're a fireman. You see what I'm saying? To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. It's not just not doing anything wrong. It's not doing what we know to do according to the Bible. That's some people's uh, idea of Christianity. As long as I don't do anything wrong, I'll be okay and I'll go to heaven when I die. I sometimes think that's why some of these monks live secluded from society in a monastery somewhere so they can't do anything wrong. But Jesus says we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And we all know that being in the world is not what but when the water gets in the boat then it'll go down and so we are pilgrims we're strangers we're on a journey and the Bible teaches us that you're in the world but you're not of the world the Bible says don't be conformed to the world but the Bible also says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not brother Ramsey told the story one time I remember hearing hearing him preach this when I was a little boy he said two ladies of his church came to the altar and they was just a crying and a crying. And he said, what's, what's the matter? And they said, we don't know. He said, well, why are you here? And they said, well, we, we just don't have any joy anymore. Just seems like we don't have any joy. He said, what have you been doing? They said, nothing. He said, maybe that's what's wrong. You haven't been doing anything. You see, Christianity is not just not doing anything wrong. When the Apostle Paul got saved on the Damascus Road, the first thing he asked the Lord is, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And brother, if you will read his life, you'll find he got so busy in the positive realm, carrying the gospel to the Gentiles, making his missionary journey. He was so busy doing good and doing right and preaching the gospel and winning the lost. He didn't have time to worry about whether or not he was not supposed to do this or not. In the Bible, it says one man was given five talents. Remember that story? When his master came back, he said, Look here, master, I've taken the five that you've given me, and I've multiplied them to ten. Here's my ten talents for you. And the master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. To another, he had given two talents. And when he took his journey, in the time he was gone, he came back and the other servant said, Master, thou gavest me two talents. Behold, I have doubled them. I've increased them to four. And here they are. And the master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. His blessing was just as big as the other one. But now the third one, he had given one talent. And when the master left, 
This man hid this talent in the earth. When the master came back, he went and got it, said, here's the talent that you gave me. I was afraid I hid it in the earth. And the master rebuked him and said, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10. Now, wait a minute. This fellow could have said, listen, here's the talent you gave me. I didn't spend it for liquor. I didn't bet it on the horses. I didn't spend it on drugs. Here it is. I didn't do anything wrong with it, but he was condemned because he hadn't done what he should have done. How simple. And yet, the sin of omission that Jesus pronounced judgment upon in the lesson that I read tonight was I was hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was naked and you clothed me not. I was a stranger and you took me not in. I was sick and in prison and you visited me not. Every one of those all sins of omission. Every one of them. In everything give thanks. Does that what it means? In everything give thanks? For the sunshine? For the rain? For the food? For our clothing? For our families? For this air conditioned building? In everything give thanks. The ten lepers who came to Jesus. All of them had the same disease and all of them were dying. And when Jesus told them to go show themselves to the priest as they went, the Bible says they were healed, but only one came back and knelt down at the feet of Jesus and said, thank you. And Jesus was, weren't there ten healed? Where are the nine? Where are the nine? In everything, give thanks. I have a pastor friend who had a affliction in his throat that would not allow him to preach without coughing. Every four or five words he'd have to stop and cough. And for 27 years he begged God to heal him of that. And before he preached every time he said, God, please don't let me cough. Please don't let me embarrass myself. Please take away this cough. And for 27 years he asked. And one night, while he was praying, he realized all of the times he had asked God to heal me. He said that must have numbered in the thousands. I've asked him and 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 I've asked him. And, asked him. and that night, he said there was a truth that unfolded before my eyes. And I said, God, I promise you this. If you will heal me, I will spend no less time giving you thanks than I did in all 27 years of asking. And the next Sunday he preached. They tape recorded his sermon. Someone listened to it and called him and said, what happened to your voice? He said, what do you mean? They said, I listened to your tape yesterday and no cough. He rushed over to the church and got a copy of the tape and played it. And as he listened to himself, the tears streamed down his face. He hadn't even been aware that God had healed his voice, touched his throat. And then he began to cry. And he said, as God is my witness from that time to this, I spent much more time on my knees giving God thanks. He said, I will never, ever, ever take it for granted. I'll never forget it. And I'll never stop giving thanks for God healing my throat. You see, God knows our hearts. God knows what's best for us. And God wants us to obey his word. And I pray in this little service tonight that we might become more aware of the fact that just not doing anything wrong is not what it's all about. But it's, Lord, what can I do for you? What would you have me to do? I 
looked at the bulletin when I come in this morning. And when I saw who was going to sing a special, it said Lon Miller and then Lon and Blanche Miller. I got a blessing from just reading that. I really did. I thought, I'm going to get to hear him sing it. And after the service, I said, Lon, I want you to know, buddy, I really love to hear you play that keyboard. And I love to hear you sing. And when I hear Barb sing, and when I hear the sweet spirit, and when I hear the music, in everything, give thanks. There's so many ways to praise God. It's not just sitting around with a little beanie on your head and a robe in a castle somewhere shut off from the world, not doing anything wrong. So much more. Just like the psalmist said in Psalms 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's the negative. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. That's the negative. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That's the negative. All of those are necessary for us not to do. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate both day and night. There's the positive. That's what I like. Because you see, if we're busy doing what we ought to do, we won't have time to not do what we ought not do. We'll be busy doing what God intended for us to do. I believe today that our churches are dying not because of murder or adultery or things like that, but because of the sins of omission, the things we know to do, and yet we don't do them. You know what we do? We wait for the Spirit to move us. Or we wait till we're inspired. Or we wait till we feel like it. But I've often said the mark of a good Christian is not when we do what we do just because we feel like it. Or just because we're inspired. Brother, when I'm inspired to preach, when I've got a sermon, I can't hardly wait to get in this pulpit. I'm inspired. I want to. I'm ready. But there are times when I'm not inspired. There are times when I'm discouraged. There are times when I don't feel like it. And yet, I know that the mark of a good Christian is to do what God commands you to do, whether you feel like it or whether you don't. And a lot of times you'll never know how I really feel on the inside. You'll see a smile. Because I don't want to depress you. I want to encourage you. Because if I encourage you, then you'll encourage me. If I depress you, you'll depress me. <laughs> I need you and you need me. Isn't that right? That's right. You know, uh, we're members one of another. We're a family. Just like our physical body. You know, in all the years I've been living, I'm 58 years old. You know, this hand has never had a falling out with this hand. This eye has never gotten jealous of this eye. Never one time. There have been times when I've been building something or trying to build something and hit the wrong nail. And you know what happens? This hand will let go of the hammer and it'll grab that finger and it'll just as much say, I didn't mean to do that. And it'll hold it close. And if it's hurt bad enough, this hand will seemingly say, you just take off for a while and I'll do the work. If you turn your ankle, does the rest of the body look down and say, you clumsy thing? You should have known better. No. The arm seemed to say, get me some crutches and I'll help take the weight off and I'll help you get around. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we as God's people could work together like that. I thank God for the illustration of the body because it works together every member doing its part to help all other members. I thank God tonight for the family of God. And I know that there are times when each and every one of us are going to be tempted to not do what we know that we should do. We're going to be tempted because we may not feel like it. 
like Jonah when he didn't want to go to Nineveh. <laughs> he did not want to go. He got on a, went down to Joppa, got on a ship and headed for Tarshish. The storm came up. The whale swallowed him and he was three days and three nights in the belly of that whale. He prayed to God. And the Bible says the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. And Jonah won the all-time marathon race. Nineveh was a three days journey and he got there in one day. God didn't make him go, but God made him willing to go. Wouldn't it have been better if he'd went willing in the first place? You know, Jesus says, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. And the Bible teaches me that he would never ask us to do anything unreasonable or anything that we could not do because he's a fair and a just and a merciful God. And when he asks us to do something, we're his friend if we just do it. I used an illustration one time in preaching a sermon. And when the choir went down, I went to Don as he was coming and I said, Don, would you just sit over there for a while? And all of the choir went down and Don just sat right there. <clears throat> I began preaching. I was halfway through the sermon. He's still sitting right there. He had no idea why. But he's my friend. And I was his preacher. Without any question. And pretty soon I looked at him and I said, Don, what in the world are you doing sitting up here? And he simply said, because you told me to. Now, I'm just his brother. I was his preacher. But he did not question it for one second. He knew there was a purpose. And then I looked at the audience. And I said, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if we could be that obedient to a God who loves us with an everlasting love? And when he asks us to do something, wouldn't it be wonderful? If we wouldn't say, God, why? God, I don't feel like it. God, I don't understand why I should. God, what have you got in mind? Just be like old Don. And he just sat there, you know, just like, boy, I'm glad I did what he asked me to do. Because he fulfilled the example perfectly. And that's the way we should be with God. I used this a while back, but I'd like to use it again. Some of you men here who have to get up and go to work tomorrow. Did you, ever, did you ever really feel like getting up and going to work when that alarm goes off? What you want to do is just turn over and go back to sleep, isn't it? I think of all the jobs I've held. I've worked in a, rent, a packing plant. I hated every minute of it. I used to lay floor tile and wall tile, linoleum. I hated every minute of it. But every morning, when the alarm went off, I got up, I got ready, and I went to work. Why? I had to provide for my family. I was supposed to. I went many times when it didn't feel like it at all, but I was supposed to provide for my family. I don't like to shave. I can't shave with electric razor. They, are, they haven't made one yet that'll get close enough on my face. After I've shaved and, and Norelco, I went exactly by the instructions. Circular, you know, stretch the skin a little bit. And when I get done, I, I look like I've been uh, colored with a black Crayola. They just don't work for me. I have to shave with the blade, the Gillette blade, and the edge shaving cream. And when I shave, it's about a 10 times deal. I see this guy on television advertising this new razor and this new type shaving cream and he goes whoop, 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 whoop. When he gets all the way across, he's done. And I go. I do, I shave about 10 times for every one shave. But I've often said if I could go in a room and shave 20 times and then not have to shave for 20 days, I'd do it. I hate to shave so bad. Well, Brother Daniels, why do you shave? Because I like the clean face. I like the smooth feel. I don't like to brush my teeth. 
never have. Never have. Some people can, can brush their teeth and carry on a conversation with you at the same time. I can't. When I, when I brush my teeth, the slobbers runs down my arm and I have to pull my sleeve up. It's a mess. Why do you do it? Why, do, why go through that? Because I like the sweet breath and the fresh taste when I get on it. That's why I do it. And Brother Daniels, what's the mark of a good Christian? It's someone who says, God, I don't understand. I don't really feel like it. But if that's what you want, then that's what I'll do. And brother, after you do what God says and his peace comes into your heart and you realize that you're his friend, it's worth all of it. The first revival I held, I never shall forget it. <laughs> I've tried to, but I can't. I never shall. I didn't know how to preach. I was just 21 years old. Brother Tommy Penrod asked me to come and hold him a revival. I was called to preach on Thursday night. The following Sunday afternoon, he asked me to come and hold him a revival. Didn't have one sermon, didn't know how to preach. Got down there to his little church. The first night, someone said, Brother Daniels, there's a family here that's about to get divorced. A man and his wife and eight children. And they were all there. He was over on this side and she and all the kids were over on this side. Pray that he'll get saved. Pray that he'll come back to God and that this family will be reunited. And I did pray as best as I knew how, as best as I could pray as a kid preacher. And the last night of the revival, I hadn't felt led to go anybody, to anybody during the whole meeting. I mean, it was all I could do to concentrate on trying to preach. But the last night of the meeting, he was sitting back here about where Brother Hubert is. We stood to sing. I still remember the song, Just As I Am Without One Plea. And God knocked at my heart's door and said, Go to him. And I said, Lord, I don't think I should do that. It might embarrass him. We started the second verse a little bit stronger. Go to him. I said, God, I've seen people go to someone like that. It embarrasses them. They go home and they never come back. I started the third verse a little bit stronger. Go to him. I said, look back there. And I said, God, the pastor standing right there beside him. Couldn't he ask him? Couldn't he say something to him? We started the last verse. And I finally said, okay. All right. I don't know what I'll say. I'll go. Walked off the edge of the platform, got to the front seat, and he stepped out in the aisle, passed me by, and came right on down to the altar. I didn't want to go. I didn't feel like going. I came up behind him and I knelt down to pray. But I didn't pray for him right at first. I prayed for me. I said, Oh God, I'm so glad I finally did what you said. I had no idea what you had in store. I had no idea how it would work out. But I'm so glad I did what you did, what you said. And here come the wife and all eight kids all across the altar. <laughs> Went home that night after church, and now the following week, Brother Penrod called me and said, Brother Daniel, said the family's all back together. They went to the courthouse and tore up the divorce papers, and it's a Christian home. I knew to do good because God was impressing me. Almost missed it. You know, someone has said, God instructs us to do something and we try every way in the world to get out of it. And then when we finally do it, we brag about it from here on in. <laughs> I love to tell that story, but I almost missed seeing what God would do. He that knoweth to do good, doeth it not. To him and his sin. Let's bow our heads for prayer tonight. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this message. And God has brought back several memories to my mind of the times when you impressed me to do something. Maybe when you inspired me to preach a certain sermon, I couldn't understand why. It didn't seem at all fitting for the occasion. But God, when I did what you said, you were able to make all things work together for something good. Father, I pray that you'll help someone here tonight. 
Maybe someone, Lord, who has been holding back in some manner, feeling inferior in some areas. God, help us tonight to realize it's not us. It's you. It's not who we are, Lord. It's who you are. You who are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Lord, who would have dreamed you could have took a stuttering Moses and brought your people out of Egypt? I pray tonight, Lord, that you help us. Who would have dreamed, Lord, that you would have took a backward, shy Gideon and won the battle against the Midianites? It wasn't them, Lord. It wasn't Joshua who really won the battle at Jericho, Lord. It just when he did what you said. And God, every victory in our life, and especially in my life, it's only come about, Lord, when I, yes, when I sometimes finally did what you said. I knew to do good, but I almost transgressed your law, almost committed sin because of not doing it. I thank you for every time that I obeyed you. I ask you tonight to use this little message in some way to encourage someone's heart. That someone might grow in their Christian experience. That they might grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for each one that's here. And whatever the need is, I ask you to just give that person the courage to do what you say. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Shall we stand, please? Just to